welcome to Learn Stackstorm. Uh, Batobi is a software consulting company. We specialize in corporate trainings, in open source tooling, and then obviously consulting in everything from front end to back end to DevOps uh, to program management and also product design. So um, we do quite a bit. And we, because we do these corporate trainings, we thought it would be nice to open some of these up to the public and just give people a preview. So if there's ever a moment where you're on a team and someone says like, oh gosh, I really wish we worked more in depth with Stackstorm, but none of our developers are you know, well-versed in it, or it's just an intimidating tool. Um, we're actually a Stackstorm partner. I'm going to throw it over to Phil. Hey guys, uh, I'm going to run you guys through what our agenda is today. A little intro to Stackstorm. Um, we're going to look at some use cases and the architecture of what Stackstorm is. And then once that's finished, we'll uh, we'll move on and I'll hand uh, the reins off to Karam, who's our leading expert on all things ST2. Uh, ST2 is a very powerful um, automation platform uh, that is described as an IFTTT. Um, what that means, IFTTT is if this happens, this event happens, then we'll do that. And so uh, it's really um, an abstraction to what normal services provide when normal services provide something like Jenkins um, or you know GitHub Actions or the plethora of other DevOps tools that we have available to us. Um, these tools are very specific um, in what they're trying to accomplish. For example, uh, something could be you know continuous deployment, something could be baked into continuous integration. Um, but what Stackstorm attempts to do is it tries to abstract all of that into a, a very cohesive package uh, that's able to do quite a lot given arbitrary signals. So as an example, if we're looking at continuous integration, and we have a lot of examples here, um, just because of how Stackstorm, how powerful Stackstorm is. Uh, for example, for continuous integration, uh, if something like a GitHub push action happens, so somebody pushes to their GitHub repo, then Stackstorm having a sensor would pick that up and act upon it uh, based on some sort of rule. And the acting upon it would be calling to down to a workflow or an action. So if GitHub, GitHub action push event happens, then we're going to execute test and build. Same thing for continuous deployment. And you're going to see this a lot. We're going to go through a whole bunch of use cases as well as some really interesting, weird ones in a second. Uh, but you know, if a new code artifact is detected, so if it was, uh, for example, the sensor was watching Artifactory and a new artifact comes in, then we see the artifact and we're able to act upon that artifact by deploying that artifact to some more like EC2 or Kubernetes. Um, auto remediation, which is a very important step in DevOps. This is the ability to not have your SRE engineers on uh, on call all hours of the night when things go wrong. This is at least a first attempt at trying to fix that. And so if perhaps the server becomes unresponsive, what we can do is we can restart that server. Um, and the reason why obviously you'd want that is it bakes in some uh, amount of uh, layering between you and your SREs who are going to be having to come in after hours and red eye their whole night away trying to fix some server uh, when really all it needed was a really quick restart. And this also helps for when load becomes high as the auto remediation, it's much like auto scaling in a lot of ways, but auto remediation just says, you know, if something goes down, let's try to fix it now before we, uh, before we escalate. So notifications. Um, again, this is one of those ones where it's a sensor that's looking at something that is uh, a notifier. So it could be database, it could be Slack, it could be a whole plethora of, of sensor points. And we'll get into what a sensor is in a moment. Um, but in this case, you know, if something happens to a database, for example, let's go notify people um, so that they are aware of the issue and that they can act upon it. So this is very much a visualization um, and monitoring step. But again, you, what you're doing is you're tapping into the underlying data and you're expanding the notification potentials outside of something like Grafana or uh, Prometheus, um, and instead moving it to Stackstorm, where a lot of these can be controlled uh, via you know, our code. Okay, and IoT, these are the last two, and these are my some of my favorite ones. So IoT, Internet of Things, if our site becomes inaccessible, uh, let's turn all of our, our you know, CEO's house lights red. And so he knows exactly what's going on. Well, hopefully he does. Uh, otherwise, he's going to think something bad just happened to his lighting system or someone might have hacked in. But in this case, uh, we've already told him like, hey, your lights are going to go red and you're going to have to come and uh, going to help us out. 
Um, and he knows that Batovi.com has, has become un, uh, inaccessible. And so really what I'm trying to get at the point is, is that if a sensor is detected, then we are going to look at a rule. And if the rule matches, we are going to do an action. What is a pack? A pack in Stackstorm is a unit of automation or integrations. Um, so basically they come in two flavors. We have integration packs and we have automation packs. And what these do is they extend Stackstorm so that they because uh, so Stackstorm itself is very arbitrary. It's very small scale, uh, but through packs, you can really bulk up Stackstorm to do many very specific and interesting things. Um, integration packs are packs that extend Stackstorm to integrate with external services, which is a really good and concise way of saying this. This is uh, external services such as Jira, such as Slack, such as your database. Um, it could be a site. It could be pretty much anything that you can think of as sensors are written um, by you uh, or by the Stackstorm community. If Stackstorm community already has it, you can just leverage theirs. But uh, building a stack is very easy. In fact, we're going to be building a uh, small pack later. And then we have automation packs, which capture automation patterns. Uh, they, they are what basically define what Stackstorm will do when the sensor is picked up. So the packs that are sensors are integrations, and then all other packs are automation. Um, so let's break down the anatomy of a pack very quickly. Uh, triggers are what I was talking about earlier. Those are sensors, those are webhooks, those are manual um, runs. And so we can kind of look at this as push, pull, or manual uh, triggering of a, of a stack storm um, action. Pulling is something like a sensor. It's pulling data, pushing, pushing to a sensor such as webhooks, um, or what we can do is we can manually trigger it just to see how these actions run. And so uh, there's the triggers come in a lot of flavors. Again, it's very um, open to how you want to write your sensor and where that sensor is pointing to. Uh, rules are what determine when an action happens. So if a sensor goes off, it doesn't matter what sensor goes off, the rule is going to look at the sensor and say, is this my sensor that I'm supposed to be acting upon? And if it is, what am I supposed to do to act on it? And when it does act on it, it's going to look towards actions and or workflows, and it's going to trigger whatever whatever is defined within the rule. So sensors, as I preluded to a bit ago, are written in Python. So they're written by us, um, and they're not by us as in Batovi, but I guess we do write uh, sensors and stacks and packs, um, but, uh, but written as developers. Uh, developers are the ones that write our sensors, and these are things within Python code. Um, you, can, you can generally leverage Stackstorm packs. There's a huge array of, of available packs to, uh, to be used. Um, however, if you have a very specific use case, you might want to uh, consider writing your own or taking something that exists and uh, using it as the baseline for your own. They inject triggers into Stackstorm, which can be matched to rules for potential action execution. Um, and they must follow the Stackstorm defined sensor interface, which is well defined on their doc site. You can go to stackstorm.com um, and uh, you can find everything that you need to write what is a sensor. Um, but essentially, a sensor is uh, if something happens, uh, push that action towards Stackstorm and allow a rule to, uh, to act on it. Uh, triggers, which are, uh, there are a tuple of type string and optional parameter object. Um, so basically, they are the thing that is triggered by the sensor. Uh, this is what is a part of the sensor that calls off to the automation packs in the background. Um, and so triggers are what rules are essentially coupling to. Um, and the rules and the uh, workflows that we've talked about previously, uh, those are the uh, actions that Stackstorm is taking. And so when a sensor is, uh, when sensor picks up data, um, there is a trigger point to that, to that sensor. And so the sensor enacts, or sorry, the sensor creates an event and then the uh, automation in the background enacts on that, uh, on that trigger. Webhooks. Okay. So the webhooks are the, uh, basically this is the, point where you're pushing data to the sensor itself. So instead of the sensor being a pull approach, webhooks are using the push approach. Um, and usually they use HTTP post, although that doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, but uh, webhooks are, again, they're just a different type of uh, sensor. So instead of looking at the data, you're pushing to the data. And a good example of this is when GitHub Actions, if something you know finishes on GitHub um, using GitHub Actions, you can trigger via GitHub to push that event data to a sensor that you've created that is essentially sitting there waiting for data. 
Uh, sensors versus webhooks. So sensors integrate with external systems versus webhooks that are sitting there waiting for the data to come to them. Um, you can look at this as sensors are they're passive until an event happens within the within the data source that they're looking at. Once that data is uh, triggered, which we talked about a moment ago, um, the trigger then takes the event and pushes it along. Whereas webhooks are passive until data is pushed to them. And once that data is pushed to them, that is the trigger point and the trigger um, then pushes the data that was received by the webhook uh, along to you know, Stackstorm's underlying rule and then hopefully to a workflow that's been connected to it. Uh, sensors are usually preferred as they are the one, they are very easy to set up um, and they offer a pretty fine grained control over the data that's being watched. Um, it's easier to watch data and then act on it than it is to be pushed to. Um, as well, you have to consider that uh, when you're pushing data to um, a webhook, uh, there's you know prices involved, there's, there's obviously cost involved. Um, but as well, you might uh, overload your system as uh, if you have uh, thousands of webhooks um, being, being pushed, sorry, you have thousand events pushing to webhooks, uh, that might become uh, a little a little unruly for the uh, uh, Stackstorm sensor, or sorry, the Stackstorm webhook uh, to pick up on and act on. Um, as well, too, um, it's generally speaking, it's easier to create a trigger um, for a sensor as triggers are, if I see this event if in the data, then I'm going to act rather than the webhook, um, which might be just pushing uh, arbitrary data towards uh, towards the triggers. So the components of a pack, this is all uh, this is all kind of leading up to this. So as I said before, if then uh, if that, then this. And so we have our sensor here, which is uh, going to be triggered. Let's say we have a GitHub action and we are watching our GitHub account. Uh, we had somebody push to our GitHub account. And so we want to trigger on that. So we have a rule that's created that says if somebody pushes to our GitHub account, then we are going to do this workflow. And so the trigger uh, pushes, or sorry, the rule picks up the trigger. Uh, the rule then says, okay, this meets the criteria of the rule. I'm going to go ahead and push down to my workflow. The workflow picks that up. Workflows are a collection of actions that want, we want to take on a rule that has been triggered. Um, and so the workflow calls out to its appropriate actions to, to enact a piece of work. Um, on the other side of that, push-based. Right, so we have lots of inter, uh, external integrations, and when our GitHub account, which we've set up with a webhook, which obviously takes a little bit more configuration and setup, um, is triggered, the webhook uh, triggers the rule, which says if this webhook triggers, then I'm going to call out to a separate piece of workflow uh, that is pushed downstream to the workflow, uh, which then calls out to the action. So because of how Stackstorm is created as a, um, it's an arbitrary orchestration tool in a lot of ways, um, the sensors can be written for just about anything. And so we're about to get into use cases, but I'll try to kind of give you one now. Um, uh, as a home project, I'm sort of setting up how a, a home weather station using Stackstorm. And so the idea here is that if sensors are, are truly just sensors, what we could do is we could say, well, listen, I have a terrarium and I want to watch the humidity and temperature. If a sensor is triggered on the humidity and temperature, then I'm going to take a specific action such as turn on a heating pad or turn on the lights or turn on the mister. So Stackstorm is incredibly flexible in in the use cases as it really is just, um, you know, it's it's it'll arbitrarily take any amount of work that is an event and then do an executed action on it. Okay, so now uh, you know about each and every component that what is the definition, what are the actions, what are the workflows, uh, what are the triggers, sensors, and uh, webhooks. Just one thing to mention and related to webhook and trigger. Uh, when we create a sensor, we register trigger at the time of creating a sensor. If you're creating any custom sensor, uh, you write a Python code. And when you write that Python code there, you register your trigger. Uh, while it's not necessary that for every trigger, there should be a sensor. If you are just using webhook, let's say, which is push based, uh, you can register it uh, along the way when you're registering your rule. You do not need any custom sensor. 
Uh, you will get to know more about this when we will see the snippets of code, but this was just to give you an idea. So let's start. We will start with first how do we work. We will see the code snippet syntax. And similarly, we will uh, see the syntax for workflows. Uh, this is the syntax of rule. Here, the syntax is using webhook. As Phil mentioned, this is push-based. It will push data to your stack stack. Uh, so it's divided basically into four parts. This part is optional. We'll talk about it. In first part, you specify the metadata of rule. What will be the name, description? If you want to keep it enabled for all time, you specify it true. Otherwise, you fall, uh, flag it as false, and you can enable it when you want. And then here in the trigger, you specify that which uh, on response to which trigger you want to take this section. So as I said, here we are using webhook. It does not need anything else. You want to register any new webhook, you specify the URL for your webhook here in rule file. And when the rule would be registered, your webhook type trigger would be registered. Uh, while in the case of sensor, you will have to register it in the sensor file in the sensor uh, Python code. So we are just registering our webhook type of trigger on this URL. This means whenever somebody will send push data on this URL, it will take this action. And then this part is optional. You can specify some criteria that I want to take action only if there are certain pieces of data that match or does not match. There are different types in the documentation. You can use regex, you can use equals, you can check if it contains any word or if it does not contain. So there are a number of few types based on criteria. Then you just perform the criteria. If it matches all the criteria, it will take particular action. So in action, you specify the reference of your action. And the syntax is you specify the name of your pack. If you're not using name, if you're using the pack reference, you use the pack reference and then dot, uh, then you use the exact workflow that you're using. You will know more about this when we'll be doing hands-on, but uh, this is kind of uh, directing the uh, directing the trigger to, uh, to take a particular action. If there is any parameter that you want to pass to your workflow and it's coming from this data, you can pass it from here. Uh, in this example, I have just passed this string as well. It's not mandatory that you pass it in the rule, but this data, for example, it's coming from this event. The, if, if your action is expecting something like that, you can pass those parameters here. So this was the syntax of rule when we are registering trigger with webhook. So next is the syntax of rule when we are registering sensor. So here, if you see only this, this portion is changed. Here in trigger, you are just specifying the type of your trigger. Your, uh, so the registration of this trigger will actually happen when your custom sensor would be registered. So in your Python code, you would register this sensor with this specific name. And then in your rule, you're just specifying that on an event to this trigger, I want to take action. You're not actually registering it here. Uh, from Stackstorm, they, uh, they provide some internal sensors that comes by default with Stackstorm, and they all start with prefix st2 dot. This is one of the example that's provided by Stackstorm. It's interval timer. Uh, for every one hour, it will trigger, and there can be mandatory parameter. That's how you provide the value for those mandatory parameter. This is the ex another example. Uh, rest of the parts are same for the uh, rule syntax. So that's, that was all about the rules. Uh, you, rules, it takes the uh, data from the trigger and in response, it take particular action. Now let's talk about that action that it takes. Uh, action is one unit in the workflow. This is the piece of code where you are doing actual work. Let's say you want to restart a server. You will specify that in one action. If the server is restarted successfully. You want to send success email. That is another kind of action. If it fails, you want to alert people. That's another kind of action. So every unit where you are taking actual action, that, that's called the action. 
there are multiple ways to implement the action uh, from stack storm there are built are built in runners uh, what are runners runners provide the execution environment for example your action is built on python then uh, they have a python runner which provides you all the python based execution based environment libraries and everything similarly there is built in runner for shell and uh, we will talk about orchestra as well uh, but that's also one of the runner for complex kind of workflows we'll talk about where to use that one uh, but yeah it, it already have built in runners as this phil already mentioned we already have community packs uh, provided that are ready for use these are mostly integration type of packs where if you want to integrate your stack storm with the jira github pager duty there is already uh, like integration done you can just clone it and they are ready to use uh, i will show you the example in hands-on we, we will be using one of the pack from exchange text on as well so when developing an action we divide it into two parts there will be two yaml files uh, well one which will contain just the metadata about action and other where your actual logic will be residing so this is the action metadata this will just contain the metadata for that particular action. Uh, you will have to specify the name, description, and then you, you, have, you have to specify the runner type. If your action is based on Python script, you write here Python runner. If it's shell based, you write here shell runner. Uh, here in this example, we are using this orchestra runner type, which is used for complex scenarios where your workflow has multiple action it is neither Python, neither shell. It can be Python. Another action can be shell. The third action is calling some different action. So where it's multiple action calling different type of uh, workflows, that's where we use orchestra. In simple words, if you are developing one action, you use Python or shell. If you have multiple action, that's what we call workflow. You use orchestra runner type. And then you specify the entry type for your metadata like where is your actual logic residing so in this particular snippet it's uh, residing in directory workflow in this file this file will contain the actual logic or actual action that would be taken and then if you want to keep it enabled by default uh, you specify true and uh, any input parameter that your workflow is expecting you will have to specify those here you, you will have to specify what exactly the name of the parameter, if those are the mandatory parameter or if those are optional, and you will have to specify the type of the parameter. Um, so th this is very important that sometimes you can get error if the type you are passing in metadata is one, but you are actually passing a different type of data uh, that that can uh, like give you errors. So this is like uh, very carefully you, you know your data and, and accordingly you provide your parameters. If there is any parameter that you want uh, to be masked in logs or console, you can specify it as a secret true. So it will be masked in logs and console. And this is all about the action metadata file. And as I told, action we take it into two parts another will be the actual action yaml file or workflow yaml file so workflow this consists of multiple action we talked about action metadata this will be the file which will contain the actual actions these are also written in yaml file they can take input they can provide output and you can manipulate data using jinja or yakl uh, if you are implementing a workflow, use Orchestra. If you are just using Python script, use Python runner. That's uh, that's uh, we have already like discussed about that. So this is the syntax of workflow. Uh, this is the piece where complexity can grow based upon your business needs, based upon the integration you want to do, and the amount of data and type of data that's coming in. But this is very simple snippet that I have taken to describe the syntax uh, so let's understand you will specify the version for your pa uh, for your workflow if there is any input parameter that your workflow needs it should be specified here and it should be matched with the action metadata 
parameters that we talked. Any parameter that are required, you, you specify the schema for those parameters here, that what will be the type, if these are the mandatory one or not. And then in the workflow file, you specify that these are the input parameters that I'm expecting for me to complete my execution. Variable section is uh, optional, but if you are using any variables, you can specify it here. Uh, we will talk with about one example uh, where you can have issues, but uh, it's the same thing. Like for example, you are publishing something here and if it's conditional based, that means you're not publishing your variable. You can specify it in where, always empty. We will talk about in when, when we'll do hands on, but just to let you know, if there are any variables in the code, you can specify here. Otherwise you can just skip this whole complete path. And then finally task is the area where you actually specify your actions. So in task, this is one of your action. This is your second action. You can have multiple action. And the syntax of writing uh, action inside task is you write the name of action that you seem appropriate. And then finally, in the action, you call uh, any action or the action you, you are taking. For example, in this one, Stackstorm has a built-in pack called core. From core, you are calling eco action. So you specify that what action you are taking and then in input, you provide any input parameter that it needs. I will show you when we will do hands-on that core, packs, eco, action, expect any message. So this is not doing anything actually. This is just echoing, like printing this message on the console. Uh, but this is very useful when you want to know your data. I will show you how. So. This is this is basically where you do your actual part. Your action is done here. But now if you want to take any, if you want to continue after this action, that's where next part come in. Uh, let's say you want to run your action only when this action is completed successfully. Then you, you can specify a condition that when succeeded, this means when this action is succeeded successfully, then do the name of the next action. In this snippet, it's the search existing ticket action, which actually, which should be the third action here. But just understand that after do, if you want to run this action, you write do colon space and then parallel test. So this means when this action will be completed successfully, it will do this test. If you do not provide this condition, both of these action will run simultaneously. If you want to run it in serious wise or based on a condition that it run only if it is succeeded, then you can specify the when uh, block. And what is the publish? Publish is any output parameter from this action, which you want to pass as an input to the next action or upcoming actions. So I hope this is clear here. This this is uh, I, this is just to give you an example. I put it a string low, but if there is something that is actually coming as an output from this action, you can publish it here and use it a, as an input in the next action. So in, in a directory of pack, there will be rules, there will be uh, workflows or actions, there will be any script, and then there will be another file pack.yaml. This is how Stackstorm know that this is not a common directory. It's actually a pack. This is where you specify all your pack specific details. Uh, you specify your reference and name. Let's say this name is actually kind of a string where I'm using uh, spaces. If you are taking this kind of name, it's mandatory that you specify your reference name so that in, the, uh, in your uh, execution, your pack would be referenced by this string. And this string has a restriction. You can only use small letters or digits or underscores. And uh, it's, it's highly recommend that you keep your directory's name same as your pack reference. Uh, so as to avoid confusion. So you specify the reference. If you specify the name with the Spaces, it's mandatory that you specify the reference. Otherwise, in the name, if you provide a string like this, it's, it's acceptable. 
you provide description that what would your pack would be doing, any keyword based on which you want to search for pack, version of your pack, or their email, any dependency. Let's say your uh, this pack is calling any other pack. You specify those dependencies here. And then when this pack would be installed, automatically the dependent packs would be installed. Then there is another file config.schema. Uh, so I'll just give you like an example. For example, you want to integrate your stack storm with GitHub. Uh, now to integrate it, you, you need your GitHub specific information. You need your GitHub URL, username, password. And those things you store in config file. Uh, you store it at the path root opt slash stackstorm stash config slash your pack name dot yaml. There is, that's where you store that information and pack is going to use that to integrate with the external system. What config schema does, if you provide any information config schema, it validate that information against that configuration file that is residing in opt stack storm config dot pack uh, slash pack. So for example, this is Jira API URL. You have specified that this is one of the configuration parameter. It should be of type string. Uh, if you want to give any default value, you can provide here as well. But let's say if it's a, it's a secret, you don't want to default or provide value here. In your configuration, you can provide the static value or you can store encrypted value in Stackstorm's database and you can fetch it in your configuration file. But you specify the schema that this should be of type string and my this value should be a secret. Now, when the pack would be registered, uh, like when the pack would be registered, it would make sure that all the schemas are validated. If you specify this particular parameter should be secret, it should be stored as a secret there if it's dynamically taken. Uh, otherwise it fails. If you does not like include this config schema file in your pack, this means no validation would be done uh, against your configuration file. You cannot leave this file empty. You have the option that you do not include it in your pack, uh, YAML file, but if you're including, you will have to specify uh, configuration schemas for your configuration. Yeah. <laughs> then uh, <laughs> continuing with workflow, uh, with workflow, you can implement very complex procedure. You can do branching, you can do lo looping. This is one of the example where you can do branching based on uh, outputs. If certain, if there is a input, uh, there is an output A, you take one type of action. If the output of this section is B, you take another type of action. Sorry. And then again, branching, if input, uh, output is A, you take this, B, you take this section. So a fairly very complex branching and stuff can be implemented with the uh, with workflow. It totally depends upon the business needs, the data manipulation, like what type of data you have and how much it is, but it can go fairly, very complex. Few more workflow feature. Workflow can be nested into another workflow. You can call multiple workflow from one workflows and there is no restriction in level. Uh, you can call like one workflow, which is another, again, calling 10 of the other workflows. So there is no level of restriction. This is one of the feature. And uh, action input can be changed to an input of subsequent actions. So this means, for example, this is one of the workflow. A means action, W means workflow. Action is calling another workflow. Workflow is calling another one action and another workflow. This workflow is calling another three different actions. And then after these all workflows are finished, a particular output of this workflow can be used as an input to next action. So yeah, again, this is again, a very complex scenario can be created. Um, for those of you who are familiar with Ansible, this is a lot like the difference between roles and playbooks versus tasks. An action represents a task. It's a singular piece of work where a workflow represents a collection of work. Um, similarly, for dev uh, for developers, 
Um, if you're looking at this from like functions perspective, um, there's layers of functions, right? You have the smallest layer of like single unit work functions uh, versus multi-function um, or larger collections of multi-functions within one singular function. Um, and so sort of the, the fall to this is that uh, what you can do is you can kind of nest workflows within themselves. Um, and why you would want to do this is, well, obviously, if one workflow is um, relevant to multiple upstream workflows, uh, then uh, what ends up happening is um, you can build very specific small scale uh, action flows or workflows. Um, and those can be called by larger um, you know, actions slash workflows. Uh, from the from the upstream and then utilized. Uh, so for example, um, if the smallest unit of work was checking the database, uh, checking the database might take three small actions to do. And so there might be multiple upstream workflows that could take advantage of such such a workflow um, across your you know plethora of playbooks or in this case plethora of work workflows. Uh, this is the scenario where uh, we can use looping as well. Uh, so, it's just that uh, from one uh, action based on certain criteria, if you want to take multiple different action, you can do branching. And uh, so in this, let's say you have an input of array and on each element you want to take these action. So you, that, that's also possible. Uh, on each element, you take different action and you kind of loop on each element and uh, I mean, yeah, we, we, we can see it in the code. I, I think I have an example included in one of the code snippets, but we'll see more. Uh, I will quickly uh, like, would like to tell you about what is join. So let's say you're this action, uh, you want it to run when all of your loop uh, loops are actually completed. Then you specify that join, wait for all loops completed. If you do not specify that, let's say your loop is gonna go over certain 10 elements and five of it are successful, five are still in pending state, this will this action will start. It's, it will see that, okay, something is successful, I'm gonna start now. But if you put a join statement that wait for all or rather wait for at least five number to be completed only then start, that's what is the purpose of the join is. Other useful features, uh, you can enforce the number of execution that can run simultaneously. You, you can specify that uh, uh, at one time I want to specify, like I want to run only two action or three action. Uh, you can specify that in the policy. You have the option to delay your action execution. You have the option to cancel from CLI as well as from user interface. Uh, for data templating, you can use either Jinja or Yakult. And uh, this I already mentioned that Stackstorm have a data store where you can store your key value data. You can encrypt it and you can uh, uh, call it into your configuration file if you do not want to store your data like site specific secrets uh, decrypted or just like static values so yeah how to use taxstorm and how not to how to use it's it's actually a, a like a difficult uh, question the hardest question it totally depends upon your business needs what you want to integrate how uh, what is the amount of data that is coming in uh, what you want to achieve at the end of the day that's that's totally dependent on that, but how not to? That's uh, that's exactly where we come to max question. You, if you already have existing infrastructure or platform, you do not have to reinvent the wheel. You do not have to scrape everything and start on Stackstorm. You keep that. Instead, you put your Stackstorm there to do any other tasks that are missing. If monitoring is missing, you can do, if you already have a CI, CD monitoring everything in place, maybe you want to start your auto remediation uh, instead of somebody having on call 24 by seven, you want to take certain steps that are very obvious or that can be scripted via Stackstorm and only want to come on call if it's like super urgent and 100% need human intervention. Stackstorm can make calls as well via pager duty. So, yeah, that that's that's why where how you how not to use if you already have something that's where you know, you do not use text on. Again, 
the same thing that you do not reinvent the wheel. You have existing infrastructure that's that's well and good. You just put it put your stack on there and integrate with everything. So now uh, we will proceed with hands on. Before we proceed with hands on, uh, if anybody have question in theoretical part, any term that you do not understand, please let me know, and then we will jump into the hands on part. Stackstorm, I have uh, like the hands on. I have divided it into three parts. First, we're going to explore CLI, but that's where I think I will show you uh, what the output of each command is and uh, uh, what you can see. And then in the second part, I will install a whole pack from Stackstorm Community Exchange. Uh, that's also something I will show you. Uh, it's not, uh, I'm not expecting everybody to join me, but the third part, I want all of us to do together where we will develop a pack and in that I'm not doing any integration with GitHub or Jira because everybody have their own accounts and uh, it, it might not be wise to put everybody's secret, but uh, I will just demonstrate how we create rules, webhook action. That's where I expect everybody to work with me. And then finally, when everybody has an idea of syntax, I will demonstrate you the actual GitHub integration that I will be only doing and you will be watching it because uh, I have already, uh, in my VM, I have already done some integration with GitHub and Jira. And for the installation, uh, yes, uh, there is, uh, uh, from Bitovi, we have our GitHub action using which you can uh, uh, spin up new instance in AWS and there you will have a uh, Stackstorm deployed. But otherwise, if you have any other type of environment, Guidelines are very clear on documentation. And if and for me, we already have AWS instance where we have a stack storm and deployed. So I will be just directly showing you the output of each command. Okay, I'm inside the server where we have our stack storm deployed. And now we'll go through each CLA command. So if you want to check that uh, your Stackstorm is installed and what version is installed, there's a Stackstorm version. So you, you know that Stackstorm 3.80 is actually installed. That's how you can verify. And to perform any Stackstorm related uh, operation, you will have to log into Stackstorm. And uh, from CLI, that's how you can log in ST2 login, and then you specify use your username. So now you're logged in. Now, if you want to install your pack or you want to change any configuration inside the Stackstorm directories using CLI, you can do it because you're logged in into Stackstorm. And then uh, if you want to list all of your actions, this is the command you use. Sorry. Oh. So if you can see from here, uh, the first uh, part of substring is the uh, reference of your pack. And the second part is the, your workflow name or action name. So we have few action from the core pack that is provided by Stackstorm, chat ops provided by Stackstorm, uh, GitHub, this is, I guess, I have downloaded it from community stacks. That's why you see it here. Jira, I have downloaded it from community stack. This is Jira pack related actions and uh, all any Stackstorm in builder, you can see it here. So, if you want to run any action locally just to test it, uh, for example, we have a, in the core pack, we have local action. Let's execute any Linux command on the local host. Uh, we can just try to run it and uh, see what it does. Core is the pack and local is the action. And then you provide any input parameters that it's expecting. So we just executed the date command. Uh, 
you executed this action, you provided this parameter, and uh, this is your result here. So you see here the result and you see the output here. And this is where it shows here that your action is succeeded. If you rem remember the snippet in the code, you can specify if it's succeeded, only then you take next action. That's how it checks that it succeeded or not based on this flag. Now let's uh, list the sensors. So any component, it's I guess the basic command you st2, component name and then space list. Uh, these are the, I think these are from the Jira and GitHub pack that I installed. And this is one of the built-in sensor that comes from Stackstone. And if you want to get more information about any sensor or any component, actually, you write ST2, write the name of the component. In case, here, we are trying to get the information about sensors. You write sensor and then get and then the name or reference of that particular component. Now, are sensors installed with packs alongside packs? Uh, yes, the, yes, sensors are installed within packs. So here, if you can see, this sensor is installed inside a Linux pack. And this is inside GitHub pack. So when you see the reference, actually, uh, the part that comes before this dot, the first one, it's the reference to a pack. And the second is the reference to that component that we would draw like in this case, sensor and above, as I tell you, like this is the uh, actions. So yeah, this is the more information about sensor. You can know what type of trigger it is and you can, where is your metadata file residing? And let's provide, what is your entry point? This means uh, uh, where is the actual logic written for this sensor? name of this sensor what is the pack name for this sensor linux this this means it will be always ref referred by this reference id uh, yeah and if you want to see what input is needed you can go to the metadata file and that's how you can know let's see the trigger list so i hope it's very clear the difference between sensor and trigger sensor which sends something and uh, yeah so sensor is something that sends and then after that trigger comes into place triggers take that data from sensor and then go to the rules and if there is a particular matching criteria match accordingly route it so these there are different type of triggers that we have from code pack, uh, from GitHub, from Linux. So that's how you can list. Listing is all like same and same. Similarly, like getting is also just like uh, it's same command. You just have to change your component name and uh, the reference ID, reference name. So here you can see for this trigger, uh, what is the parameter schema? It uh, it needs type. So this means that uh, uh, the type of the parameter that would be required, it's object. If there are any, uh, like you can say, how you, how can you say it? Like there is any leveling of that data that inside that data, the date would be of this type. And uh, there is any another type, like there is any another field inside the data that would be, let's say of type integer, you can specify that in one data. Uh, if there are levels in the data for every field, you can specify some some schema that this should be of this type particularly. Mm. Now let's list the rules. So 
So if you remember rules where it check based on a trigger, it routes the traffic to a particular action. And uh, if there is any metadata to compare against that. So we have, uh, these are three rules actually that are, uh, that I have downloaded. I was doing for training purpose. There is one rule that I will show you. It's related to GitHub. And then there is another rule related to Jira. And then there are some internal rules. This is coming from Stackstrom Exchange. If you want to get any rules. So you see here the things that we talked in the syntax. Uh, this is the metadata for the rule. This will be the action that it would be calling whenever trigger uh, that is specified here triggers. So here, let's say somebody sent a data on this URL. And if that data is matching to this criteria, then this action would be taken and along with this parameter passed. So that's how you can check the rules and then we can list the execution. So when, uh, when we execute a rule, if rule is, uh, we can know that if uh, successfully it triggers uh, an action in response to that, or if like it, it did not trigger because the rule was not matching or something. I will show you in the troubleshooting part few commands. Uh, let's say actually data was received via that webhook and rule started, but after that action was not started. The reason could be that your data actually did not match. Uh, that's how you can check. You list all the execution. Let's say your recent execution was this. You pick this ID and you dig and you check, I will show you in the troubleshooting part, you can check for that particular execution that whether it matched rule or not. If you see it does not match rule, you just check what type of data came in and what type of matching criteria you have specified. This is one of the important command when it comes to troubleshooting because mostly like your execution are the thing that causes problem and you want to check. So this is a little bit about CLI. Now you get to know like how you can list things and see inside it. Uh, now we will go into GUI and I will just give you an overview of user interface. And then we will, uh, I have already installed community pack, but I will show you how to install it. And then we will take a one action using that community pack. So this is uh, what Stackstorm user interface looks like. These are the tabs we have in history. You can see history of all your actions that you have executed. Uh, in action, you have your pack name and when you elaborate your pack name inside, there are different action. You can go inside any action and then you can provide the input fields here. These are the mandatory one and then just run it. The same way we executed code.local from CLI. Similarly, you can run it from here. If we see local here, you just provide a command, you just run it and it will give you the same output. If you want to see any execution history, you can go into execution and you can see the history. Here it will show you the overall result, but let's say your workflow is nested, you click on your see full history. And then here, um, I will show you here, the, the branching like symbol will come and you can expand it to see which of the action worked and which of the action did not. So that's about the action workflow here. These are actually the packs, just remember. Uh, when you expand this, that's how you go to any particular action or workflow. If you want to see any rules, that's in the rules section here. Uh, this is one of the example of rule. 
that I showed you on CLI, and you can see it from here as well, that whenever there is a webhook trigger on this URL, it will take this section when this criteria is matched. And if you want to see any rule enforcement that if rule was triggered, uh, let's say you do not see any action execution. So you want to see your rule actually triggered or your rule also did not trigger. That's you can go to enforcement and you can see your rule execution history. This is, an, for example, here you can see that your rule actually successfully executed. And if you expand it, it will show that here it will show that uh, uh, rule was successfully executed. Execution, the data was sent to action and action was triggered. If no action would be triggered, it will mention something here that execution was not created. That's how you know that there is something wrong in the rule, not in the action. So that's about the rules. Inside the packs, you can see which packs you have uh, and which packs you want to remove, which packs you, if you have default packs here available, you want to install it from here, you can do that. Uh, these are the installed packs. Triggers, uh, like we talked about the webhook trigger, any sensor, you can see it here. So this is the webhook. Let's say your rule also did not started. Now you want to see that did actually your external system sent the data to Stackstrom or your Stackstrom did not receive a data at all. That's where you go into these triggers. For example, if you're sending data by webhook, you go to webhook and you check instances. This means your Stackstrom received data. Now, if the rule did not start it, that means something is wrong with the rules. Okay, so that's about the Stackstrom user interface inquiries. Uh, so for example, you have a workflow where you want to continue it only if you have a certain outproof, output from user. Let's say you have enabled a second factor authentication. Uh, you have one example of inquiry core.ask, where it will ask you for the second factor code. And only when you put that, it will continue its execution. That's one of the example in inquiry. So you can use it for that purposes. So now you have a basic idea of the user interface. Let's see how you can install any pack from the user interface. If you want to install it from um, CLI, there are commands on documentation. If you want, I can provide it at the end of the tutorial, but let's do it from, from user interface. So when you want to install the pack, remember you do not go to pack, you go to action. And here we have a pack named packs. Here we have all the action related to packs. And you want to install it, you click on install and you provide the name or Git repo URL of your pack. So for example, I installed this GitHub pack from Stackstorm Exchange. So this is communities organization where we have so many repositories, GitHub or where we have so many repositories related to different platform. And we want to, let's say, install GitHub pack. So you go to that pack and below all the uh, prerequisites are already mentioned in readme here. If you see, they, they mentioned that you copy this file in this path in your uh, Stackstorm instance. I have already copied this path and because my credentials are not encrypted, so I will not cat it, but trust me, I, I, I just use the same thing. In If we just look into this, YAML. I provided my classic token for GitHub here, provided my username, my password, uh, web URL and base URL, I kept it same. And rest of this st uh, stuff, I kept it same. And I, as they mentioned, I just copied it to this path inside my, I can show you quickly. So you can see I have it, but I will not get it because my secrets are not encrypted. So once you've moved it in, does it automatically apply? Uh, no, you will have to execute this command. This is the only part that does not register automatically with the pack. 
you when modifying the configuration, you will have to execute this command. There is one more command with which it would be registered as well. And it asks you one at a time. I will share you that. I don't have it handy, but I will share you the command in that. Let's say you execute that command. It, it will prompt you that, okay, what username you want to set, uh, what password you want to set, what token you want to set. And when you set all of this, it will ask, okay, are you confirmed that you want to save this in the file? You will say yes. And then that will automatically reload it. But if you are just copying it like this, like it's mentioned here, you will have to execute this command to register that configuration. That's one of the uh, thing to remember. Let's say tomorrow you change your configuration file and you may think of why it's not taking effect. That simply means you might have not registered it actually. So I have put this file there, I have registered it. The next thing is to uh, just download the file. Uh, so you just take, you just copy this URL and how you install it. I have already installed it, but I will show you how I, I have already installed it. And I will show you like, for example, this is the Jira pack I installed. So you just provide your, URL, maybe I can try showing any other pack. And it seems to me that you're using a stack storm action to install the pack itself. Yes, so that's what I mentioned that uh, when you install pack, you do not go to pack section. Here packs means either you want to install that something available already, or you want to delete. But if you want to install a pack either from your directory or from GitHub, you go to actions. Inside action, there is a packs pack this is the name of a pack packs and inside packs there are actions that you can take related to your pack installation or deletion and in our case this is just an example where i'm gonna install this pack we are not going to use it i don't even know how this work in incubator one i haven't worked with but i'm gonna show you how we can install it so we just put the uh, put the url if you are installing pack from your private repository, you provide your credentials here, username, colon, uh, password at the rate GitHub. It's failed, maybe there are some mandatory input parameter that it needs, but that's how you install the pack. I haven't done, I haven't worked with this, but I have successfully installed, you can see this. The only thing that I did, just put the URL of that pack and executed run. You just try rerun. Oh, and this is what you mentioned earlier with the branch. So this is multiple actions taking place within a workflow? Uh, yes, yes, exactly. So in, inside the workflow, you see the, this is one action, this is another action. So it's, it's multiple action. And this is how you can expand it. That's what I was mentioning. You want to expand it, you go like this. And then inside here also, there can be a nesting. This is very straightforward, but there can be a nesting inside here. As so well. when there's another workflow that has a collection of actions, there will be another branch that is a dropdown? Yes. So if I show you like my... There's no expression that it does. I don't think I have example in this training, but yes, it will show. Let's say you have another workflow calling. There mm -hmm. will be a symbol like this here, mm -hmm. and then you will be able to expand that as well. Okay. Yeah. So now we have installed one faction. So, okay, you. You already know that I already had a GitHub installed from Core Exchange, but I rerun. If you are rerunning from the same pack, if there is, let's say, any update that is in that pack, it will take place, it will take effect. And if you want to install an action from a particular branch or commit, you can just specify it like this. Uh, install and you paste your URL and then equals to and then your branch name or 
to meet hash. Let's say your branch name is Kara. You do it like this and you execute run and your back and your pack from that branch would be installed. So I guess it's it's very easy to install a pack and everybody knows. Now let's run this community pack. Uh, this GitHub is community pack. It's coming from Stackstorm Exchange and uh, you can run any action. This is type of integration pack where your Stackstorm is getting integrated with your GitHub. Uh, let's try to create a file. Actually, I have done some. Let me show you first what, uh, for example, this is one of my GitHub repository and let me delete this file and we will create it again with the help. Of... So by just us, uh, you know, just expanding on that a little bit. So the test or sorry, so a pack is not automatically updated within Stackstorm. So one of the first workflows that you could create is that when a release happens for that pack, you want to update the pack on your own local Stackstorm? Yes, that can be automated uh, depending upon your use case. Yeah, sometimes you want to do it manually based. Let's say if, if the changes that you made in pack are expecting some different kind of data or input, you want to make sure that it is there. Stackstorm is receiving that appropriate data. Only then you want to install. Uh, it's up to you. Otherwise, if you think everything is always going to run smooth, it's same type of thing, you can just automate it to run whenever it's merged into master or something. Got it. Yeah, it, it totally depends on use case. So now in our GitHub repository, we don't have any test.md file. Let's create it with the stack storm. So you see these are the uh, mandatory parameter that we'll have to provide. We can write the content that we want to pass to file. So stack stone, we need test message, a commit message. Where you want to create a file, I'm just gonna create it in the same level. In which repository? My repository name is and then user or organization name. My org name is Victory. And then none of the fields are mandatory ones, so I will leave all those like this. I just click on run. And in the execution, we can see that it has been successfully completed with this commit. And if we go back into our repository, we refresh it. You see, we have a test.md file and we have that content that we wanted to place. So that's one of the example for ready to use packs that we have. Um, now, I will, we, we all together gonna create a pack and then, uh, Phil, do you have a instance ready for everybody? Yes, give me one it's second. Found for all of you. The only thing that will be different for all of you that you will keep your packs name different. Everybody should have separate pack names so that you do not collaborate each other's changes. And uh, I, I will I will tell you two three fields that you you will have your unique uh, names for those. Well, it seems like we have a question. Oh yeah. Um, so I have a question related to a workflow run. Let's say one step in the chain fails, which results in board in aborting of workflow. In the meantime, someone fixes the bug and now wants to continue the workflow workflow from the step it failed previously. Um, does the Stackstorm UI allow us to start it from that specific failed step? Um, will it also remember all parameters that were passed in the initial workflow request? So okay, this is good question. So. Uh... 
let's say you have a workflow. Uh, let's say this workflow failed uh, or it had a nested step which failed. And if you start or rerun that workflow, it will execute all of its nested workflows. But if this workflow did not have a link to next workflow or action, let's say you were running some action parallelly, all right? Your this action failed, all other either failed or passed, but you do not have any link in between those. So now you will rerun this section. Only this would be re, I mean, only this would be re-executed. Rest of the action, because it does not have any link to this one, it does not have impact. But if all these are linked into another workflow, uh, it's just like this. There is another workflow inside this workflow. That workflow is failed. You rerun that workflow and all the action inside that will be re-executed. And if you want to take a re rerun only one particular action, either there should be a linking. If there is no linking, uh, those will not be rerun. So, I mean, it may be very confusing, but because I have worked with some complex data, so I'm trying to explain it. But for simple use case scenarios, if there is already a chaining in the data, one of your action fail, you rerun, all of the subsequent chains will restart. It, where it stopped, it will it will be able to start from where, from right from there. Did, did, did I clarify info? Uh, yeah, it sounds like it. So the answer is yes, you'll be able to restart it from that specific spot while retaining the data. Yes, yes. But there can be some complex scenarios where there is not chaining. Uh, I have this uh, thing phased in my client's work, but that's different. I mean, in simple case scenarios, it's yeah, you can rerun and all of the subsequent action, those will be re-executed. So this was created via our uh, actions, our GitHub actions. Uh, Leo kindly passed this over to us. Um, I'm assuming prior to you set up the additional user accounts in, in the uh, user data? No, no, we will be using just one account and everybody will log in with the same. It's just that they will create their different packs. Sure, okay, give me one second. It's, it's ST2 demo, ST2 demo. I have posted all of the information that you'll need uh, to get your own StackStorm spun up. So if you want to continue this after the fact, uh, you can feel free to uh, to grab that and uh, I'll send it out via LinkedIn as well as uh, some of the follow up emails that we'll uh, inevitably send out. Um, but uh, we host a GitHub action that can easily create the StackStorm instance for you on an AWS account. Uh, and additionally, I've also linked in the infrastructure via Terraform. So if you want to get your hands dirty and want to create your own instance and manage it more uh, manually, uh, the Terraform will allow you to create all the working components of what StackStorm needs. Um, and then uh, you can just use the StackStorm installation doc, which I've also linked in our chat here uh, to get that working uh, for today. Uh, feel free to log into the StackStorm instance. It was just posted by both Karam and I, and the username and password are both as T2 demo. Okay, so for this first, you will need to create a GitHub repository and do not go into my naming. Uh, the naming convention should be, it can use lower letters, underscore and digits. So please create your own GitHub repository with lower letter, underscore, digit combination name. And then we're gonna develop a pack inside that directory because I already have it, so I'm not creating anything new.
So I hope everybody has created the GitHub repository and we have cloned it into local. Let's create it. Let's create the path finally. So this is how your pack repository will look like. Uh, you will have two folders, uh, actions and rules, and then you will have two files, config.schema.yml and pack.yml. So let's start with pack.yml, create a file with exact same name, pack.yml, and then specify uh, these details. Reference, do not use this name. I want everybody to have their unique pack name so that you do not collaborate with the changes. Maybe uh, suffix it with your name or something. And you can only use underscore small letters and digit. And as I mentioned, if possible, keep it the same as your repository name. So your repository name, st2 underscore github underscore training, here the reference name is matching. So you, you do the same, just your unique own reference name. And even the name should be unique. You can just write small string, but it should be unique. So put something uh, which can uniquely identify your pack. Description, yeah, you can, you can use same like me. Uh, this is not necessary because we are not actually doing any Grafana or GitHub integration. This is my older one. And then you specify the version of your pack, which must follow the server format, major, minor, patch. So you can specify the same as if you are seeing on the screen. Uh, you can write your name in other and email. And you, you do not need to write any dependency. We do not have any dependency on GitHub or anything in this pack actually. So I hope uh, you have all these details. These two, three details are mandatory. And if it's all there, we can move to next file, which is config.schema. You can leave it. We are not using config file because we are not integrating it with the external system. You do not need this file in your pack. Let's directly go into rules directory. Inside rules directory, you create a rule. You can create it with the same name. It's not a problem. Uh, you just you can write the name of the file and name of rule same and then description keep it true the other thing that you, i would like you to change is that in your webhook everybody register it with unique url so maybe suffix it with your username uh, with your name or something so that you can send data to your own webhook url so this thing I want everybody to have unique. Rest of the thing you can keep same. Yeah, you can keep same if you. I have just for test purposes I put it my name, but if you want to use your name, you can do that. This is not necessary. It's not a problem at all. The only thing this should be unique. This, you might have already developed this YAML file. Let's go to the action uh, directory. And as I described when I was dis uh, discussing the theoretical part, we will have two portion. One is metadata. So you specify the name of your metadata file and you specify an type orchestra. This you can use the same file that you are seeing in the GitHub repo. It's not a problem. And similarly, even the other part, yeah, you can copy it same as it is. Uh, just to let you know what we are doing here, uh, we are running workflow of three action. First work action is not doing anything actually, it's just for demonstration purpose, but this is useful when you want to manipulate your data before you take any action. So you run your noop action, you manipulate your data, either Jinja or Yakul, 
with the other ginger yakal hair in publish. And then you use that data into your next action. Uh, for example, here, I, I mean, of course, you could use directly this control X user here, but sometime uh, your data manipulation is complex. You have some looping, branching before you get exact output. You can do that logic part here, and here you can just pass directly the data. So here I'm using the Jinja expression. And uh, this means that uh, this user value is coming from input. When it's coming from input or from context, you specify it ctx round brackets dot user. And this expression means it's gonna evaluate this expression and take the value. And if you see this user, we have defined in metadata file. We do not have defined any default user. So this means value should come along with data, that means. And in rules, I have, I'm taking this user from the trigger that the, the data that we would be pushing to webhook. There I would be sending user name curl. That user would be passed to user and then that would be passed here and would be used here. And this whole string I published into a new variable called message. And this variable, I'm using it as it is. This is, as I told, this is just a string. If there is a complex manipulation that you want to do before you input your data, you can use core noob or even core echo because this does not actually do anything. This does not do anything. This just print anything on console. Uh, so it, it's very useful in those cases. And then when this is succeeded, only then you want to take this action because now we are using this message input from here. It's very important that we put when condition succeeded and failed because otherwise this input, it should come from here. Otherwise it will run parallelly and it this will throw an error that I'm not able to find the message parameter. So you will have to run these two sequentially in sequence wise. And then third action, you want to run only when the second action is successfully finished. Uh, it, this this is doing not doing anything in your local uh, in your local host. It will just create a new file named training.txt. So I hope this everybody has copied this. Push this into your respective GitHubs just to make it clear again. This should be unique, name should be unique, your repo name should be matching with your reference, and your webhook URL should be unique. So now push it into your GitHubs. If you're pushing it into your branch, uh, that's also okay, because I have pushed the same con code on hands-on branch, and uh, I will be installing that branch. Now in this instance, you guys have access to this instance, go to action, go to packs, go to install. And if it is, a, yeah, I, I would say create a temporary token that you destroy after this training because it will be shown here. We are not uh, covering encrypted part here. But if it's your private GitHub repositories, you will specify it the way I'm going to do it. I've already installed it but you will put equals and your branch name, and that's how username, colon, your token, add the rate for your public repositories, and uh, create this temporary token, which you should destroy after this training. Could you pass me that in Slack? Uh, this, this command? Yep. Yeah. I will just uh, remove my... Yep, wash it out. I mean, though it's visible to everyone, but I'm going to anyway delete it after this meeting, so. So after putting that URL in packs, you just click on run and your pack should be installed successfully. 
if you face any issues if there's any failure let me know and we'll be able to troubleshoot well, i've t posted the token format in our chat so if you're just wondering what that needs to look like go ahead and grab it from there so if you see there are two packs successfully installed already Why does it need to show here? Oh no, these are not those back. Oh yeah, this is the back that has been used. No, it's it's not the pack that somebody installed. No, it's the once you install, you'll be able to see it in your packs install history, and it will also show up here. Just like my pack is showing st two GitHub training in st two Jira. <laughs> Let's proceed with first uh, checking the actual execution. So for me, the pack name was this, and uh, I'm just going to rerun. Uh, no, inst uh, sorry, we have configured the webhook. So I'm going to push the data using webhook. And if you all are ready, we can send you the API key to send data using webhook. Uh, just to show you what data I am sending, it's this data. It's just JSON data key value pair, user, bitovi, path, this repo. Just check if you want your rule to match your data, whatever user you want to match, you pass their data. Here, like I want to match it with Karam. So I'm gonna replace this thing with Karam. This is the data that I would be sending. Rest, these two things are not mandatory. Actually, we are not using these anywhere. So you can just have curly braces, user equals to current or whatever matching criteria you have specified. And then this is the command to send data via webhook. Uh, Phil, the only thing that's that need editing here is the api key that that you created mm -hmm. and the url this url is for my vm we have to replace it with the user's vm okay so you execute uh this if you see uh when when phil shared you the command if you see after d at the rate this is the file name where i am storing my json data you have to specify your file name, whatever data you are specifying. If you are just sending it directly, uh, you do not need add symbol and file name. You can send it uh, directly, uh, double quotes, and then curly braces, and then key value pair. Phil shares you. I'm going to show you here what is the curl command look like. It looked like this. Uh, this is the URL for the VMs that we have shared with you. You will... Uh, Phil will share it with you and he already created st2 api key for all of you that you would be using to send webhook trigger and that's this is the part I was talking about you will specify the name of your file in my case this is st2 hyphen github dot json whatever your file's name is you can specify that if you want to pass data directly instead of file you can do that as well uh, but if you just want to keep it like me, you can just create a file, create one field that you specify in rule and trigger this command. So, okay. I'm not in the same repo. So when you, 
uh, when you issue this command, you should have output like this, whatever the data you are sending. If you are seeing that on your console, that means your webhook uh, trigger is successful. Now let's check, go back into our instance and check if the rule is triggered. First thing we triggered our data. So let's check if there is any new trigger in the webhook type. Let's check the instances. And this new instance is triggered at 1224. This means, yeah, it's the our instance that we just triggered. Now let's check if our rule is triggered or not. So I sent the data where my user was Karam and my URL was this one. Let's check if there is enforcement. Yeah, you see there is an enforcement. One more thing I forgot to tell you in the command. Uh, yeah, here after webhook, you have to specify your respective URL that I told you to be unique, that you specified in your rules. This URL, you, you, I, I told you it should be unique. You put it there and then fire the webhook trigger. And then when you will check your rule, uh, it should look like this. It says succeeded. It says execution has been created with this ID. This is the input parameter pass. So let's check if our workflow executed or not. Let's come into action. This was the workflow. And let's check the execution. We see that there is a, at 1224, there is execution, which is successful. Let's check the history go inside and we see that all of our three actions are successful. We are just publishing message. Uh, this means this whatever message we have provided would be equal to console. And we are creating a file into our local host. Let's see if this file exists there or not. So you see this file exists in the root, at the root path. So this means our workflow has executed successfully. And uh, I hope it's, it's very clear to you. I will quickly show you integration with the other Jira or GitHub that I have developed. It's, that's something that I will be doing and you can just shadow me, follow me to see how it works. Uh, I will install a different pack and show you what's inside that pack. So now I install the hands-on branch, but then I will install the main branch. What is the difference here? Here I'm actually doing a GitHub integration uh, after echo and these test, a GitHub file would be created into my GitHub. I'm not gonna run this because you already uh, sh like see it from the community exchange, how we can use that community exchange to create a file. You can create, you can use that community exchange action in your workflow. You can call another action or workflow. This means calling another action. If you want, I can quickly run it, this as well. So let's install the main branch. So I have installed main branch. Now my workflow execution would be different than the previous one. 
I'm going to fire another webhook trigger with the same data. Okay, so this is another example where we were able to push the data, but instance has never been created. This means something is wrong with our rule. Our rule has not matched. So let's try to troubleshoot. Uh, and I'm gonna share uh, two commands. I will share you these commands uh, in the message. Let's run these first. So first you want to check that if your rule is executed, enforced or not, so you provide the reference of your rule. Only this one is executed, but we we triggered something at. Isn't it because the pattern is Batovi versus uh, Karem? Oh, yeah, yeah, you're right. The data did not match. rule has triggered and let's see the action action has failed oh yeah the because we already had this file actually in our github reports it's not i don't and uh if you see you in you elaborate it and you see it's failing at create file and if you remember when we executed the code pack, we already created the test.md file. Let's try to rerun this with different file name. So yeah, the action is succeeded. So now I, I rerun only this section. So only this section rerun and uh, it says, the file is there. Let's check if on our GitHub we have a file. We have current.txt, yeah. I think with this, our hands-on is completed. I can just from the GitHub, I can show you another. I, I don't want to very complicate this thing. Uh, so I will not actually run that one but I can still show you the Jira integration that I have done because there are some important, we'll just check the workflow for this one. The rest are the things are all same. So in this particular workflow, uh, there are a few things that are different and that can be very useful when you will be developing workflow in production. Uh, one of the thing is it's in what it is doing it's uh, you are providing a jQL query based on that query. It's trying to search any existing ticket from the Jira. And once it found the existing ticket, 
if there is no ticket that match to this jquil query it will create a new ticket if there are already existing ticket it will just comment on those ticket so there there is branching that we will be using and in this one we are also using kind of looping here so that's why this this can be very helpful in production scenario so what we are doing in this section we are calling stack storm exchange jira pack search action the mandatory input is jquil query uh, you can learn about jquil query from jira documentation and then uh, i'm branching based on that if it is succeeded and if the result of this ticket has more than one element this means we already sorry less than one this means on our jira there is zero ticket that matches this jquil query then we want to create a new ticket then it will go to this workflow it will create a new ticket you specify your input parameter in which project what summary what type of ticket any extra label you want to provide i'm using jinja here and this is very important that your field should be uh, exact same type if you see in the jira label expect array of string you have to provide it as an array of string priority expect it as a key value pair you provide it as a key value pair so all the inputs have been provided and if there is any description you want to give you provide it and then you are again branching that when it's succeeded i want to publish these things from the result this means you will have ticket id for the ticket that you have created the key the url and finally you are just outputting these values this means when you will run the pack in the stack storm you will be able to see what is the output of this the other condition is if there are already more than one tickets or at least one ticket that match with the same jquil query in jira then you do not want to create a new ticket you just want to comment existing ticket and let's say you have three tickets you want to comment on each of those tickets right so you have existing ticket in one array and you want to loop on those after finishing this task you caught all your ticket keys in ascending order and you saved it in existing ticket array and then in this workflow on this array you are trying to loop it that for every ticket you provide it as a key it comment on every ticket so this is the syntax we use for looping we have a really good blog written by dylan uh, uh, i would ask heather to share it with you how to use jinja yakl and the best practices but this is one of the example where you looping on your all existing tickets and on each ticket you are trying to take this action commenting issue so this is one of the uh, example scenario where we have branching as well where we have looping as well yeah before i conclude it the important things to remember always make sure you know your data those are the things that will give you error you know the type of data and whatever you are passing you you should know whatever type is expected is, is same as what type you are passing uh, be very careful with the jinja and yakl evaluations this blog will help you to understand more where to use for loop where to use if where to use yakl versus where to use jinja uh, so yeah that that's it from my side and uh, thank you phil thank you heather and thank you everybody for joining i hope you have some takeaway from it